right at that same spot uh, rather than metastasize. And a way to try to, in addition to an operation where all the disease is cleared, to continue treatment by uh, putting down a film that will slowly elute chemotherapeutic agent over a period of time in an effort to try to reduce the risk of recurrence at that site. Um, the standard of care, as you know, is a macroscopically complete resection that is removing all the grossly visible disease. But for tumors, particularly in the retroperitoneum, uh, retroperitoneal lyomyosarcomas or liposarcomas uh, or other uh, sarcomas that can occur in the retroperitoneum, the, re local re the local regional recurrence rates, meaning the recurrence right at that site where the tumor was, despite removing all the d disease the first time around, are quite high, up to 50% or more uh, after removing all the visible disease. Um, and unfortunately, uh, those individuals, uh, in, in those individuals, uh, these local sites of disease can progress and eventually cause mortality rather than disease spreading to the lungs or to the liver. The role of adjuvant therapy, uh, such as chemotherapy or radiation therapy, ha is not clearly defined. Uh, adjuvant chemotherapy ha does not, has not been proven to necessarily reduce the risk of local regional recurrence in patients with retroperitoneal sarcomas. Radiation therapy is under investigation, uh, and uh, there is some controversy as to whether or not it, it does um, uh, improve results. We tend to typically, we tend to, to re recommend it routinely, but other institutions are not so um, uh, fond of radiation therapy. And in fact, that might be, uh, that is, there is a phase three study that is in development in Europe to try to analyze the radiation question. But right now, the standard of care is still getting all the tumor out, plus or minus radiation, unclear if chemo has any benefit. One of the potential solutions is to give local drug to the surgical bed uh, to deliver the chemotherapeutic agent directly to the site where the uh, recurrences happen. And there have been a number of treatment strategies that have been developed in other malignancies, including intratumoral injection of drug, uh, targeted adherent or injected drug-containing nano or micro, uh, sort of micro or nanoparticles, degradable hydrogels, reloadable uh, pumps, hyperthermic intraperitoneal uh, chemotherapy, or HIPEC, uh, and biodegradable wafers. And I'll talk briefly about each of these uh, to show um, how they contrast with the agent that we're developing. Most of these have, and sarcomas have proven to be ineffective, short-lived, or toxic, uh, and, and, and uh, have also had problems in other malignancies as well. HIPEC is, um, has been uh, around for uh, uh, several decades now, and mostly for um, colon cancer, appendiceal cancer, that, uh, and ovarian cancer that have spread throughout the um, abdomen. Uh, however, it's associated with a high morbidity rate, uh, about 30, or greater than 30%. Uh, the clinical efficacy in uh, most tumors is uh, questionable, and in sarcomas is, is definitely debatable. Uh, the benefits in most studies are not consistently reproducible in, in other studies, and particularly in sarcomas, um, when you take out the, the patients that have GIST who tend to do better, uh, there's almost no benefit to the other types of sarcomas that uh, occur in the abdomen and retroperitoneum. And there's never been a, there's only been one study that's looked at individuals that had primary sarcoma. There's just a few number, a few patients, uh, patients who did not have a recurrence, uh, and there was, um, and, and really there was no uh, proven benefit there. So uh, this is, while it's used for certain other types of, of cancers, this has not really been proven to be effective in sarcoma. Another, uh, something that you may have heard of is gliadel. This is a wafer that contains, um, for malignant gliomas. And this is basically a biodegradable wafer that's placed by neurosurgeons in a tumor bed after, reduce, after uh, removing the tumor, and, and often there's some tumor left behind. This does improve survival by about two months, but recurrence rates are high. And one of the problems with uh, gliadel is that it's a very hard, uh, rigid wafer. It's small, and it doesn't really conform to the um, tumor bed necessarily very easily. The other problem with it is that it just releases the drug as a single burst, and it uh, doesn't uh, re release the drug over a long period of time. And sometimes that drug burst release can actually cause its own toxicity. So what we've developed is a um, polymer film that's loaded with the chemotherapeutic agent paclitaxel. Uh, paclitaxel is a mitotic inhibitor. It um, is hydrophobic, but it can go into this particular film. It's been used in ovarian, lung, and breast cancer and as a single agent or combination therapy for sarcoma. Um, our, the uh, films are, uh, that we've developed initially are about a centimeter in size 
and they're actually very, very thin. They're about 40 microns thin in and of themselves. We actually then attach it to a um, scaffolding that's made of bovine pericardium, the same kind of tissue that's used for prosthetic heart valves. Uh, and uh, what we did was we did a, a number of studies, including a mouse model of recurrent sarcoma. We took a specific sarcoma tumor line that when we implanted it in mice, removed the resultant tumor, we found at least an 80% recurrence rate. And so we took this as a model, implanted this tumor, uh, this was a, a, actually a chondrosarcoma cell line, implanted it in the backs of mice, uh, let the tumors grow to a certain size, then took the tumor out. This is an example. This is the tumor here on the back of the mouse. Uh, the tumor was resected and uh, basically similar to what we might do for retroperitoneal sarcoma. We get out the tumor without, as much, without a great margin. We then put the film on. This is the film. Sutured it to the back of the mouse. And then we uh, and randomized the mice to either getting the film uh, with the drug, film without drug, IV drug, or nothing further, just resection. And then we assessed for recurrence um, following the mice out for at least or for up to 100 days. And we described, or we define recurrence as anything that recurs on the back of the mouse. And what we found was that when we, in the mice that got this film, uh, the rates of local regional recurrence were uh, much lower than they were, or the uh, freedom from recurrence rec uh, survival was much better than for the other three control groups. So this drug-eluting film did seem to have uh, a significant impact in reducing this recurrence at that site. When we looked at overall survival, we didn't actually expect to see much of a difference, but we actually did see a statistically significant difference uh, in overall survival as well. Now, um, so what we found was that this film reduced the risk of local regional recurrence. It improved overall survival, but it was not associated with any, and it was not associated with any particular side effects that we might see from systemic chemotherapy. The mice maintained their weight. There was not any problems with major wound breakdown. Uh, and in another study, which I didn't uh, show here, we also monitored tissue levels, both in the local tissue as well as in the blood, and we found that um, very little of the, of the uh, chemotherapeutic agent that was in the film actually got into the bloodstream. It was all concentrated right there in the tissue, and we could measure very high levels in the tissue, but almost no le uh, measurable levels in the blood. So we think this is a, an interesting um, theoretical uh, approach. Uh, we are trying to develop newer films. We have a second generation film that uh, has greater tensile strength so it can stretch, so you can attach it to structures like the diaphragm. Uh, it's much larger. We actually, uh, we're working with a bioengineer or, or a biomedical engineer at uh, Boston University, uh, and we basically took him a sheet of paper and said, you know, retroperitoneal sarcomas are huge. Uh, I need a, a, a sheet of uh, a film that's about this big so that I can put it back on the tumor bed uh, after the tumor is taken out. And we also want the film to accommodate a, a much greater variety of drugs. So we're, the, our current generation of film, or the first generation takes Taxol, but not a lot of other drugs. Our second generation film also seems to incorporate gemcitabine, and we're still working with uh, trying to get doxorubicin in the film, um, which we're um, uh, just tweaking some of the properties on the film. We also obviously want to test this in other cell lines, uh, and we're also looking at other tumors, including lung cancer, mesothelioma, and ovarian cancer. And eventually we want to put this in larger animals to make sure it's safe. And, and, if, uh, and if we uh, uh, see some promising results, then hopefully introduce this in humans uh, uh, soon. And uh, the Brigham has been very supportive of this research and are very committed to try to get this uh, as a uh, potential future therapy for our sarcoma patients uh, above all of the other um, malignancies that, are, that we're investigating. And the final topic is image-guided surgery. This is a a very exciting uh, new operating room that just opened yesterday. It's called AMIGO, which stands for Advanced Multimodality Image Guided Operating Suite. And what it is, it's actually a three operating, a three room suite. Um, the first operations will probably start happening in the, in the uh, suite in the fall. Uh, and what it is, is basically you have an operating room in the center that has uh, these drop down uh, video screens that you can pull up images, you can do laparoscopic cases and have the laparoscopic images on there. It has uh, capability for doing plain x-rays uh, with swing-out arms here that can just take regular plain x-ray of the spine or of the, uh, of the, of the um, bones in the extremity. Uh, and at one end, there's an MRI that's actually on a track. And uh, if we want to localize a tumor once we're in, uh, once we've exposed uh, the site and we're not quite sure how close we are to a nerve or a blood vessel, we can just swing the MRI machine in. It just follows on a ceiling-mounted track. It's actually... Um, 
an, a, a regular MRI that's been flipped upside down and stuck to the ceiling. Uh, and it just moves right in on top of the patient. Uh, or if we need to get a PET scan or a CT scan, we can just do that as well. So um, this is a very exciting uh, new suite. There's, I have a few more pictures. This is actually the way the operating room itself is set up. Um, and these are the um, machines for the plain x-rays. Uh, this is looking from the operating room down to the MRI. And you can see here's the tracks that uh, will swing over to the, MR, uh, to the uh, operating room table. All these colors actually uh, indicate the strength of the MRI magnet when it's actually on, on the operating room table so that we know not to put specific instruments uh, within this area. And, and there have been specially designed operating room instruments so that they don't get uh, pulled into the magnet of the MRI. Uh, and, uh, and this is another picture of the MRI itself. And, and why is this important? So these are, this is an example of two patients where we actually may use the PET scan component of it. Uh, these are not sarcoma patients. These are uh, a patient, this is a patient with a recurrent rectal cancer. This is a patient with a, um, a, a recurrent neuroendocrine tumor. They've all had multiple operations. They've all had sur uh, operations done here uh, by the surgeons who referred them to me who haven't been able to find these tumors when they've recurred simply because there's so much scar tissue. There's a lot of radiation uh, related injury in this area. And we can't actually find these tumors even though we know that they're there on PET scan. They're um, too small to be, they, they can't be removed laparoscopically, and yet we can prove by biopsy that they are, in fact, uh, malignant. So what we've, um, before, you know, while the, we're waiting for the operating room function, uh, that new operating room functionality to, um, to really come into play, we've also uh, contracted with a company in California for a handheld PET probe, because we know these things light up on PET scan, so we can uh, essentially track the tumor by its radioactive signal with a handheld PET device. Uh, and we're actually going to operate on this patient in a couple of weeks um, with one of these new devices. And hopefully, if this uh, proves to be very effective, we'll be able to use it in the new suite. Now, the new suite, we're also going to be testing out different types of radioactive isotopes that can be absorbed that are of um, uh, less uh, radiation risk to the operating room personnel. For this particular patient, we're going to have to wait a certain number of hours for the radiation uh, um, counts to actually drop and for all the radiation to come out of these structures such as the bladder and the ureter around it uh, so that we can actually find the tumor. But the new uh, agents that are uh, under investigation, which will be used in the new suite, uh, will help us to um, uh, try to track tumors. And this is going to be particularly important for anyone, for instance, who has a uh, recurrent gist that's begin beginning to get uh, drug resistance at one particular site and all the other sites are stable. And we might have a hard time finding it because of the um, uh, of prior surgery uh, in that area. And there might be a lot of scar tissue. So this is a, a very interesting new um, uh, potential uh, treatment approach. So what are the advantages of intraoperative imaging? And why is this going to be a, a great operating room suite? So for patients who have extremity sarcomas, it'll help optimize our margins. We'll be able to look for uh, getting a wider margins where we can, but also preserve the nerves and the blood vessels uh, when they're not involved. For people who have paraspinous sarcomas, such as chordomas, we can get better margins in the bony tissues. It's hard to often see where the sarcoma is in the bone itself. And we can also avoid nerve roots, particularly when trying to preserve sensation and uh, bowel, bladder, and sexual function. For retroperitoneal sarcomas, we'll be able to use this to achieve better margins in the retroperitoneum. The current MRI machine that's in there right now is not um, going to allow us to, to get into the retroperitoneum just yet, but they're, planning, oh, they're already planning an, planning an update so that we can operate on uh, individuals with, with retroperitoneal sarcomas. Uh, and finally, in, in individuals with GIST, we'll be able to hopefully find the solitary FDG avid tumor amidst uh, a bunch of scar tissue. So uh, this, uh, they've already uh, reserved time for us to do uh, operations on individuals with sarcoma in this suite. Uh, and uh, we're getting the, the uh, proposals on the IRB um, uh, through for, for this uh, uh, approach. So in summary, um, the forthcoming studies uh, in adjuvant therapy for um, GIST, or primary GIST, uh, will potentially impact how long we actually give imatinib. The comparative effectiveness study that I described uh, that's under development uh, will help us answer whether surgery does add any benefit for patients with metastatic GIST. The drug-eluting films are under investigation as a potential treatment option uh, for sarcomas with a high risk of local regional recurrence, such as retroperitoneal sarcomas. An image-guided surgery aims to improve surgical outcomes in basically all sarcomas. Uh, and so hopefully um, uh, that will make some impact in, our, in the care that we provide. Thank you.